She draws on the behavioral sciences and conflict facilitation approaches to consult climate and clean energy organizations, develop tools for environmental practitioners in public and private sectors. Dr. Fijina has served as Director of Behavioral Science Assessment at Climate Central, as a fellow on the White House Social and Behavioral Sciences team, and as well as in the US Senate. She has published various academic journals and have been featured in media such as the New York Magazine, Psychology Today, and Scientific American. Uh, Dr. Irina Fijina will take uh, your questions, will pause during her talk to take questions. So uh, as we did before with uh, Professor Lewandowski, I encourage you to send your questions in the chat as soon as, as they'll come so that during her pause, she can uh, address your questions. And uh, so let's welcome Dr. Irina Fijina. Thank you very much for your introduction. Um, great to be with all of you. Um, and let me jump right in. So, um, so we've already heard a lot of really interesting material today um, and, and more to come. And I think um, our speakers today have really focused on the sort of media landscape and some of the ways to work with the misinformation that people are getting. And what I wanna do is do more of a deep dive on the psychological dynamics and what actually happens inside of people as this information is coming in within the landscape of our sort of social belonging um, to really understand why are these messages so appealing and why are they falling on such fertile ground. So um, we all know the problem. We have incontrovertible evidence for climate change and, and information about all the horrible ways that it's gonna impact us. And yet people's risk assessment and action in line with that risk assessment is utterly lacking. So what's going on? Um, how can we make sense of this response? So the question is, what's really, for me, what's really driving skepticism at the deepest level? So if we look at, this is yet another poll. Um, this was conducted by the Yale um, and George Mason centers on people's um, uh, belief that climate change is caused by human activities. We can see that there really hasn't been change in those attitudes alongside with accumulating evidence. So there's obviously a totally different driver of what people actually believe. So what I'm gonna focus on today is the process of motivated cognition. So we've been talking a lot about cognition and, and perception of the problem, but all of our capacity to take in that information is biased and it's biased by our motives. So what is motivated cognition? It's the strategies of accessing, constructing and evaluating beliefs that permit individuals to arrive at desired, that is motivated beliefs or actions regardless of the information they encounter. In other ways, in other words, when we receive information, it is filtered through our motives that distort that information in ways that aligns with what we want to hear and what we want to believe. And so as a result, we seek out and we construe and endorse information that aligns with our positions as well as the positions of our groups that I'm gonna talk a lot about. And it allows us to maintain and protect our worldviews, our preferences and our perceptions. And we do that by dismissing information that doesn't align with what we want. We also misunderstand it. And then we fail to uh, encode it in our memory and then fail to um, recall it from our memory. And so as a result, we end up dismissing evidence that contradicts what we want to believe. We uphold our existing beliefs and we fail to take action. So that's really the core psychological process underlying um, this phenomenon. So what are our core motives? Um, let me pose this question to you just to contemplate for a couple of seconds. What do you think is people's most core motive? It's not certainly not the only one, but to the extent that our survival needs have been met, what do you think and maybe you could drop a couple of things into the chat. What do you think uh, drives our behavior beyond just the need for survival? Um, I find this to be a very um, insightful thought exercise to engage in. So what research suggests is that our most important motive is the need to belong. And that includes our families, our groups, and the larger ideological system that we're part of. 
Um, and so we respond to climate change and to everything else in our lives through that lens. And that includes more immediate needs like our health, our family and children, our economic well-being, our need to be safe and secure, as well as the, the, the well-being of the larger system that we're part of and through the lens of our identities. So what groups do we belong to and what are the ideas espoused by those groups? And what are the beliefs and worldviews and ideologies that those groups and those systems hold? So those, um, the needs to, to feel good and protect all of these different facets of our lives become powerful motives that bias the way that we receive information and what we do with it. So, Identity is really central as a result of this need to belong. Uh, and we align our beliefs and our attitudes and behaviors with the group that we belong to. Uh, and the reason we do that is because our need to be accepted and welcomed and valued by the groups that we belong to is extremely important for us. It, it's a matter of survival. That's how we evolved as a species. And that the, the primacy of that needs remains. And so, uh, as a result, we tend to forego some personal beliefs as well as certain cognitive, um, uh, let's just say unbiased processing in order to maintain and align with our groups. So for example, for a lot of politically charged topics, people's reactions are, are based not on fact or personal preference, but on whether their group or political party endorses or rejects a certain position. And there's interesting research showing that when you give people um, a position that's endorsed by their political group, they will endorse it. And if you give them another randomly assigned group of people, a position that's exactly opposite and told that their group uh, endorses it, they will as well endorse it. So it's it, it's we're really malleable in our in our responses in that way. And we align to our group groups. And so as a result, the norms and the prescriptions of our groups have known as social norms have a really powerful impact on what we believe, how we behave, and the actions that we take towards issues such as climate change, as well as all others. Um, related to this is uh, the notion of, of cultural cognition, cultural cognition hypothesis, um, that the idea that attitudes about climate change are kind of ideological badges. They are a sign of your belonging to one ideological group or another. Uh, and those beliefs signal support for the worldview that one subscribes to rather than a new position based on the evidence or fact or information. Um, and so if one's in-group is hostile towards climate change for self-interested reasons, such as the case for Republicans in the US, then people become adept at denigrating information and the sources of that information, such as scientists, in order to uphold the view of the group. And what's particularly problematic about that is that the more knowledgeable people are about climate issues, actually the more polarized they become because um, it gives them information and, and um, sort of ammunition for creating counter arguments and dismissing inconvenient evidence. So that's sort of identity related stuff. And now I wanna to move to an even broader level of sort of defensiveness and, and bias processing that has to do with um, our system and our ideology. So this is a, an area of research called system justification or system protection. And this is a powerful motive. There's been a lot of research on it in areas other than, than climate change um, uh, on which this is based. So system justification is a motive to defend and bolster the social, political, and economic status quo. So it's sort of the larger envelope of our society and our economy that we are embedded in. So it's very important for us because our outcomes in so many ways depend on it, as well as our connections to other members of the system. And so upholding a positive view of our system serves many psychological needs. It serves the need for a sense of control and stability and predictability. It also helps us feel more safe and, and a sense of reassurance about our well-being. And it helps us have a sense of shared reality with other members of the system. So these are three you know, really core powerful motives that all align. Um, and so when we feel good about the system that reduces an inner sense of dissonance, anxiety, uncertainty, and it also can be very helpful when 
the status quo or the system may come under threat or some kind of challenge. So how does this manifest? Well, if the system is challenged, people tend to protect it, uphold it, and therefore they will legitimize what is already in place and in, including the hierarchy within the system and therefore become opposed to measures to undo that hierarchy, opposition to quality. Um, and, and it leads to a support for the status quo, so resistance to change. And as a result, it can interfere with seeing problems with the status quo as information about those comes up forming intentions to fix those problems and, and actually taking action to move things along. So it really becomes a barrier and impediment to change. And this has a lot of implications for climate change. So climate change is a huge threat to the system, not only because it threatens to undermine the system, which would suggest that one would wanna take action on it, but it's also caused by the system. So it's an endemic threat and that's really where the issue lies. So it's our economy that in a lot of ways has created climate change through industrial practices and in general, you know, our market system, as well as an ideology of progress and development and consumption that really prioritizes economic growth and prioritizes the use of resources at a cost to environmental protection and well-being. Um, and then at a social level, since the Renaissance and, and in some ways even before, we've had a notion of um, really it's a, I think a Judeo Christian idea of humans dominating uh, nature. And then more recently, the idea that technology and science can prevail over anything. And so it's, it's a kind of dominance ideology. And then of course, at the governmental and institutional level, we've had um, you know, a failure to address the issues that have come up and a failure to prioritize these issues. So on all these levels, system just um, climate change as it's occurring is really showing the ways in which our system is inadequate and perhaps not stable and legitimate and um, well rooted in the way that we would like. So it's very threatening. And so because of this global threat to all facets of the system, it leads people to engage in system justification processes and they cope with the threat by denying or minimizing the problem in order to maintain that positive view and then resist change in the system or fail to alter environmentally harmful behaviors. So let me tell you a little bit about some, some research evidence for this. So through a host of relational experimental studies with different kinds of populations, both in the US and outside of the US. What we see is that this motive to protect the system, to see it in a positive light, leads to skepticism towards a variety of environmental realities, not just climate change, um, a failure to see the, the fragility of, of, uh, of ecological health, uh, refusal to abide by the constraints of nature, um, skepticism about the need to balance economic growth with ecological health, um, and then direct skepticism that climate change is occurring, um, a greater willingness to harm the environment, less intentions to help the environment, less setting uh, of, of environmental priorities and policymaking, and a decreased actual engagement and action to address climate change. So the more people want to uphold and protect the social system, the less they're able to engage with the reality and, and respond to the reality of environmental problems and climate change. And then uh, what's interesting is that we see that that inner motive uh, explains some widespread group, group differences that we see in society around environmental attitudes. So um, the most vivid of them, which of course you know about, is the difference between conservatives and liberals. And so in our research, we see that that difference, that demographic difference is mediated by system justification tendency. So people who are more conservative tend to have a stronger need to see the system in the positive light. And that explains their greater tendency towards um, climate change skepticism. It's not the entire explanation. And there's of course a ton of external reasons, including all the things that you've been hearing about today, but at the psychological level that increases the proclivity to, to be influenced by, uh, by all that misinformation. And then it also explains several other demographic uh, differences in terms of, so people who are more patriotic or more 
strongly identified with America tend to be less willing to engage with climate change. And it explains that relationship, male versus female, more educated versus less educated. So in some way, the need to protect the system underlies differences between these groups in, uh, in climate attitudes. And then coming back around to motivated cognition, um, the, uh, the next set of research that I wanna show you is, is actually focused on that mechanism. So what we've shown is that skepticism of climate change is facilitated by motivated cognition processes. So we see that people who are more motivated to, to justify the system perceive messages um, that disparage the case for climate change is more persuasive. So people were given a newspaper article that um, essentially uh, presented misinformation that disparaged the case for climate change and people were more receptive to it if they were more motivated to justify the system. Um, they evaluated actual evidence for climate change, which was real, to be not as strong, to be weaker. They were less likely to believe it and trust it. And they believe that Americans have less control over climate change. So in other words, they were um, pushing the responsibility off. And then when we asked them to recall information that they had read in the article, they had a harder time remembering the details and they made more errors if they were more motivated to protect the system. And then in a separate set of studies, and this to me actually is been the really most interesting finding. We did some studies with folks outdoors on hot summer days, and we asked them what they thought the temperature was outside first, and then we assessed also their um, uh, system justification motives and their climate attitudes. And what we found is that a one standard deviation difference, sorry, I live across from a firehouse, um, in, um, in climate, in, motives to justify the system accounted for a seven degree Fahrenheit difference in perceived temperature. So they perceived the temperature to be lower. And as a result, they that mediated their belief in climate change. So at the body level, and it's, you know, perception of temperatures is quite a core cognitive process, a perceptual process, but cognitive. Um, so even that was influenced by our motives and that then led to a justification of beliefs. So for me, this was a very uh, powerful finding. So basically in some, oops, we can see that, the, that the, the, the motivational effect pervades you know, the, the full spectrum of our perceptual and cognitive processes, and then leads us to maintain a certain set of beliefs um, that, that align with our ideologies. And, and I think the other, the other takeaway for me is that there's an irony in this, that people are motivated to protect and uphold the system, but in fact end up um, supporting internal beliefs and external actions that ultimately lead to the undermining of the system. So it's a very counterproductive process. Okay, so just to mention a couple of other areas of research that also align with this. I mean, they're the same psychological roots, but assessed in different ways. So there's research on different personality tendencies in the way that they're related to climate change responses and actions. Belief in a just world is um, a tendency to have faith that the world is a just and secure place and um, that every person gets what they deserve. It has a bad, con it, again, helps to deal with internal dissonance and anxiety, but it leads to blaming people for misfortunes that are outside of their control in order to maintain that view of, of the world as a just place. And that is related to defensive skepticism and resistance to climate action. Um, another personality tendency is social dominance orientation, which is a tendency to see one's group as superior and uh, in control over other groups. And uh, that can lead to support for hierarchies, inequality, prejudice against groups that are in, in positions of less power. So that too has a relationship to climate change and it leads to a uh, support for human dominance over nature, even when it comes at an ecological cost, skepticism of climate change and dismissal of environmental injustice. So it's sort of group related beliefs overlaid over climate change. 
And then the last one I'll mention is right-wing authoritarianism, which is a preference for obeying established authorities and social norms and disapproval of those who fail to do so. And that too has a relationship with um, a failure to acknowledge uh, environmental realities, a preference for economic growth at any environmental cost and a lack of support for sustainability. So these are just some examples of kind of a, another area of research that takes a, a similar but different tack on the same process. Um, another thing I'll mention are moral foundations. This is yet another area of research that looks at the ways in which people perceive certain um, dynamics to be really core. Uh, there's six areas. Um, they're referred to as moral foundations. There's you know, some debate about whether morality is the right term for this, but these are basically core principles that people really strive to uphold and that feel very intuitively. They're elicited very rapidly prior to any kind of uh, processing. So they're very deeply seated. Um, they need for care, they need for fairness, they need for loyalty to group, they need for um, authority and, and group structure, the need for purity and sanctity, and the need for liberty. And there's differences between different ideological groups in terms of which of these foundations are most important for them. So liberals tend to react very strongly to care related and fairness and liber liberty related um, aspects of issues, whereas conservatives do respond to those as well as to ones related to loyalty authority and sanctity. And so uh, as a result, and also the way that they construe these different areas can be a little bit different. And as a result, when people are confronted with climate issues, the, the extent to which they see them through these different moral frames can have a really powerful impact on how we respond to them. So for liberals, to the extent that they see them as issues of care and fairness, um, that can really uh, lead to a strong reaction, whereas for conservatives, it's much more of a threat to loyalty, authority, and sanctity that can lead to a strong reaction there. And we'll come back to this in the second part of the talk when we talk about actually engaging people in action. So what are the consequences of this motivated cognition process? Well, certainly what we're seeing is this, you know, rapidly and rigidly widening ideological divide. Um, and what's particularly problematic about it is greater exposure to information about climate change leads to actually lower support because people take that information and funnel it through their beliefs. Um, and same for more education, that just gives people more ammunition for rejection. Um, you know, that leads to a great deal of public discord and conflict, uh, willful um, dismissal and ignorance of evidence and uh, underestimation of risks and failure to take uh, action to prepare for those risks. And then of course, the, the greatest cost is political gridlock and inability to engage in policy investments, actions that would lead to mitigation, adaptation, um, you know, very dire consequences. Um, just to mention a couple of research studies that are interesting on this polarization process. Um, one study looked at framing a famine that was happening in Eritrea um, as being due to climatic changes versus natural causes. And when it was framed as being due to climate change that reduced intentions to donate to relief efforts and increased victim blame among those Americans who were more skeptical of climate change. Um, public acceptance of refugees depends on whether or not they're framed as climate refugees. So again, leading to less acceptance for those who are climate skeptical. Um, and even in domains that are not uh, directly related to, to climate change, I mean, they are, but, but not yet in the sort of, sort of ethos, concerns about the Zika virus became polarized along political lines when it became associated with climate change. So in other words, climate change is the signal that tells people whether or not to believe and trust something, depending on which side of the, of the divide they're on. And then what's uh, kind of important to point out is that this isn't just about liberal and conservative. Um, motivated reasoning impacts everybody. We all engage in it. It's just a question of which beliefs it serves. Um, and so for people who actually are not skeptical of climate change, it can still lead to an, a failure to take action through a process of moral disengagement, among others. 
And so people will avoid taking personal responsibility and incurring personal costs while maintaining a positive self-image and avoiding guilt, again, through motivated cognition processes. Um, skeptics will just discount the evidence, but for those who are committed to actually addressing the issue, they will explain away their inaction despite state of commitment to the problem. There's a lot of mechanisms by which this happens. Um, they may rationalize their carbon intensive lifestyles, like by saying, you know, well, we're not doing this right now, but I fly to conferences because it's, you know, working on this important issue um, or displacing personal responsibility by placing blame on other entities, such as corporations, governments, oil companies, etc. cetera, um, making advantageous comparisons to those who are doing more poorly than they are in, in this particular domain, um, virtue signaling, meaning showing ways in which they are acting in line with their beliefs, while in fact, in many domains, they aren't. Um, single action biases. So if you've engaged in a certain action, that then becomes fodder for feeling like you've done what you need to do. And then people go on to not act in line with their beliefs in other areas. And then negative spillover similarly, um, once sort of feeling like you've completed your responsibility and then, um, and then letting go of, of those, that sense of personal commitment. So all of these are motivated cognition processes and they all <clears throat> um, allow us to rationalize either the dismissal of information or failure to act even if we do, if we aren't skeptical of climate change. So I'm gonna pause there. This is sort of the, the, the problem side of the talk um, and ask for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Fijina. I was about to like turn on my camera to say that if you wanted to make a pause, it would be good right now. So this was timely. However, I do, I'm not sure we have questions. Uh, if the, so for people in the public, this is a good moment to ask your questions if you have some until this point of the talk. I see that there were some comments at the beginning of the talk uh, when you were mentioning um, the factors that could be related and they were mentioning guilt, relative advantage, resistant to change, fear. Um, we have a comment saying that no questions yet, but it's fascinating. And um, maybe- You guys can... wanna turn your cameras on for a moment. This is something I do a lot of like teaching and talking and I, I struggle with the online environment. I love that we can connect across a big difference, but I need people, I need people's faces. So if you're up for it, turn on your cameras and we can have maybe a little bit more of a, of yeah, a the only thing is I'm not sure uh, people in the public can open their cameras. I think we only they have can't. the panel or can they? Like in my oh, view. Interesting, okay. I can only see the panel. Well, no, can't. you can't. They're oh, saying they're not <laughs> Uh, I don't know if- Okay, had, sorry, I didn't realize that. <laughs> maybe we had a raised hand, I'm not sure. Are we doing raised hand questions? Yes, if someone, I, I don't know if it's I- It's not possible, okay. I'm not- Sorry guys, no. <laughs> that explains it. I was thinking, why haven't I seen anybody yet? <laughs> yeah, so Nicola, do we have uh, anyone that raised the, their hand? No raised hand yet. But, no raised uh... hand yet, okay. So maybe well, let's. We have one now. Maybe we can just keep. Oh, we have one. Yes, from Nicolas Gauthier, who has oh, a question. I don't. Let me go for. I don't seem to. I've given him okay. permission to talk. Oh yeah, yeah. I found. I I found. Will be possible on the other account. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Oh uh, no. Yeah, you can hear me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the interesting speech. I'm kind of new to the notion of like uh, motivated um, inference and motivated cognition. I find it really uh, enlightening as a concept. Uh, what do you think are the like uh, tracks of actions we could uh, think of uh, out of that kind of thing? Do you believe it will necessarily focus on uh, individual behavior or small group behavior, or you believe there's a way it can influence the society uh, on a larger scale? Uh, the kind of like uh, theoretical kind of like um, reflection I'm having this week is how to uh, tie together like traditional disciplines such as political science or sociology with the cognitive sciences, uh, how they can intersect and how do you see action on a larger scale than 
small uh, individual level, considering the motivational inference uh, theory? That's a great question. Um, the second part of the talk is about how to draw on what we know that, that I was reviewing about motivated cognition to actually encourage um, engagement. Um, but you write that a lot of this research focuses on more individual or small group uh, level stuff. I think, um, you know, part of the reason why I have been drawn to think about the system level is, is because I think we need to really look at those multiple levels to make sense of what's going on. Um, you know, it's a bi-directional process, at least in the US where I'm based. Um, you know, th there's a lot of pressure from the population on politicians and of course, a ton of pressure from lobbyists and politicians that then gets passed down to the population. So of course it goes both ways. But, you know, I do think that you have to work at both levels. And I think usually for politicians to be able to change, there has to be cover there has to be some kind of protection for them because otherwise you just get voted out and that's the end. So, um, you know, one of the key things I think for us to think about in terms of solutions is that most people are not acting in reasoned way, ways. We're responding to social norms. I'll talk more about that. And so I think in a way, it's not really, for me, the core thing is not about persuading people one at a time. It's sort of changing the culture and changing what's permitted and what's allowed. And then on the basis of that, a lot of people will follow without having to go through that internal process of like reason transformation, which I think is outside of our reach, honestly, and never has been in our reach. So, so I think a lot about norms and setting norms and doing it in a way that doesn't challenge people's identity. So we're not all having an identity crisis because I think most of us can't handle it. And rather that there's a kind of transition that aligns with people's beliefs and needs. So that, cause right now we have this conflict. We have the conflict between either I support the economy and economic growth, or I support ecology and respond to climate change, right? This is a totally false conflict. If you undermine your ecological base, how is your economy gonna continue to, grow? anyway, it probably can't continue to grow indefinitely. But, but even for modest and reasonable growth, you have to have ecological health and resources. So the, the conflict is, is imaginary and it's been perpetuated by all this misinformation, all this motivated, um, you know, sort of skepticism that's been put out there, but we have to undo that conflict. And I, and I think a lot of it is not about reasoning through it. It's about shifting the perception of sort of what goes together. And so, you know, it's not that I have a, a, a solution for exactly how to do that, but, but that's the level at which I think things need to happen. And when you look at any sort of social innovation, um, yes, there's the people who lead the change, who are early adopters and all of that, but the vast majority of people, there's a, there's a tipping point, right? There's a point at which it becomes permissible and normative to do something, and then everybody's on board somehow. I mean, a really interesting example is, um, is gay marriage which in the, in the US, which you know, was, a, was a fight for decades and, and it felt like a losing battle for a long time. And then through some you know, very smart um, public engagement and, and political action and, and some key states shifting, somehow we reached a point where it transitioned from being uh, an issue of political battle to becoming a personal issue. So uh, uh, Republicans included backed off of it as a political issue. It's no longer seen as like in, in good taste, you know, very interesting. So, and of course now we have a Supreme Court decision and, and legal protection. So the question is how do we get to that place where we move from the polarization to sort of resetting the norms for those who've been, who've been um, you know, turned against or for whom their identity has become inconsistent with the issue. I don't know if that answers your question, but those are some of my thoughts about it. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna we have another uh, raise hand. Uh, we're gonna go and let him ask his question. It's Timothy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Irina, for the, the first part of the talk. And I have a question about the, the fact that climate change is, is a huge threat for 
for uh, the system. And some activists try to show how we could have opportunities with uh, climate change and um, especially the frame solutions such as no regret solutions. And I wonder um, if you have any ideas of how um, skeptics would react to um, no regret solutions or win-win adaptation or mitigation solutions? Because it's no more a threat, it could be seen as a, a chance. Yes, absolutely. I, I, a whole part of, a, a big part of the second part of the talk is devoted to that. I think you're exactly right on. There's, I'll, I'll show you some evidence for it, but there's a really big distinction between how people who are system protecting, we, we're all system protecting, don't get me wrong. It's just a question of which systems we prioritize and how we see ourselves relative to them. But there's a huge difference between how much people acknowledge the problem and how much they support the solutions, which really brings into question this idea that we first have to convince people and then they're gonna get on board with solutions. It seems to be kind of, they're almost separate tracks in a way. The problem has become more an ideological badge and then the solutions are, you know, they have much higher approval ratings. There are plenty of people who don't think climate change is happening and are very strong supporters of clean energy for all these other reasons, energy independence, um, economic opportunity, competition with, you know, other countries, China, all, all the stuff that actually aligns patriotism with their beliefs and doesn't threaten them as much and so, or at all. Um, so I think you're exactly right. I think that's a big, channel through this. Um, this isn't to say that, you know, that there's still, there's a lot of attack on solutions as well and, and the same kind of, you know, um, funded effort to undermine people's engagement also focuses on solutions. So, so you know, that also has to be addressed, but, but psychologically the response is utterly different. You're exactly right on. Thanks, and I'm eager to the second part of the talk then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mathieu, for your question. And we have um, two more through the chat, and then we'll have 30 in. minutes for that we can divide in 20 talk and 10 questions, if, if that's fine great. for you. That's great. So first question asked in the chat is Hugh asking, you frame a lot of your analysis in the context of conservative versus liberal, left wing versus right wing politics. Are there any other political positions that are not don't necessarily lie on one of these two sides of the spectrum? For example, nationalism that have demonstrated influence. That's a very good question. So a, a lot of the research that I was citing was based either in the US or in like highly developed Western countries. Um, and it's, I think mostly a divide between sort of those who align with like a free market ideology or or are patriotic or are sort of pro-system and those who are maybe more questioning of the system or have uh, a, another set of allegiances like for example to equality or to fighting you know racism things like that 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 come into conflict with system justification um nationalism is so I haven't looked at the exact construct of nationalism, but I've looked at patriotism and um, strength of identity with America, which is related, um, and it it behaves in the same way. So in in other words, it, it feels like there's sort of one underlying psychological process, but different ways in which it manifests, and these constructs tend to be very highly related. So. Um, uh, let's say conservatism, being a Republican, nationalism, patriotism, you know, national identity, they, they tend to go together. Now that said, people are all individual. These are just averages, you know, certainly for, for, all, for all of these constructs, but, um, but they tend to behave in similar ways. I can give you one example where we, we did this research in China and we saw that to the extent that there was a a stated ideology of sort of sustainability that was espoused by the government, we saw that people who were more system justifying supported that ideology more. So in a sense, it was the opposite as it is from the US, but that's because the position of the government was the opposite from that of the US. So the more they aligned nationally, the more, or in terms of their 
identities, the more they supported what the government was saying, which goes for any leadership. People support what the leaders of the groups with which they're identified are saying. So yeah, so I haven't really seen a lot of surprises like that. I mean, different countries certainly differ in which groups align with which ideologies. So that's for sure. But to the extent that one aligns with the ideology, they tend to support the ideas that that, that ideology um, espouses. But there's a lot of yeah variability, of course, between countries in, in terms of which party believes what, etc. Makes sense. Thank you, Dr. Fijina. And last question before we go back to the second part of the talk, which we're very much looking forward to. Uh, Rusena asks, what do you think would be an efficient way to change personality tendencies in adults, if possible? That's a good question. Um, it, it's, there's not really that much research to support the possibility of doing that very effectively. Um, I'm not a scholar of personality differences. So I just shared that research because I think it's interesting and, and relevant and related. Um, you know, uh, there's definitely research showing that education and exposure to different social contexts um, and, um, you know, other sort of shifting of one's environment can be, can be effective. Um, but a lot of it also has to do with learning how to manage threat because a lot of those responses are about managing threat. And so if people develop other means to do so, they don't need to engage in that kind of group oriented um, defensiveness. So these are just some thoughts of mine. You know, there's, there's probably far more sophisticated research out there. I, as a psychologist, I also think a lot about trauma, both personal and historical and social. And I think that plays a really big role in this, that I think people, you know, we're looking at social beliefs, but all of us are looking at them and responding to them through the lens of our experiences and our challenges and our difficulties. So I think, you know, one answer to your question is to the, to the extent that we work on our inner challenges and difficulties and wounds, we need to rely less and less on these more rigid, socially difficult sort of um, tendencies, but but that's those are challenging processes to go through and there's there's really no sort of easy quick quick answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes. we're going back to the talk. We have yes. like 30 more minutes. Close my windows. At, if yeah, that. sure. No problem. So just reminding um, people in the public to send their questions through, during the talk so that we'll have a time to ask them uh, because uh, we have like 30 minutes left that uh, Dr. Fijina will administrate. But if you send your questions while you think of them, it'll be easier to manage them at the end of the talk. Go ahead, Dr. Fijina. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay, so what can be, thank you for your questions, great questions. Um, so what can be done? So what I wanna kind of highlight here is the need to address people's needs and priorities, that that has to come first and then everything else. So, um, so I'll give you some examples from research that I've done as well as many other examples um, that I have collected from other places. So in terms of my research on system justification, given that it's centrality and why people deny and, and are skeptical of climate change, what I wanted to see is, can we somehow reverse this negative association between protecting the social system and protecting the environment? Because I think that's really at the core of the conflict. And so we call this idea system sanction change. So change that's not threatening to the system, it's actually allowed by the system. And uh, the idea is to reframe pro-environmental change as a way to uphold the status quo and to support rather than challenge the system. So it's something that can actually help it be healthy and have longevity and all of that. And, and that's a, an attempt to harness system justification motivation to inspire pro-environmental behavior. So here's an example of a study that we did. We gave people some information about um, climate change, or maybe it was about environmental challenges. And then for one group of people randomly signed, we gave them this very brief um, uh, little snippet that said, being pro-environmental allows us to protect and preserve the American way of life. This was done in the US. It is patriotic to conserve the country's natural resources. So connecting um, you know, sustainability with um, 
protecting American way of life and patriotism. And so what we found is that we reversed the negative effect of system justification. So the more system justifying people were, the more they actually were willing to help the environment. And, and this was measured in actual behaviors and signing pro-environmental petitions. So this is what this looked like. Um, so this is what you usually see, this gray line. People who are more system justifying tend to be less likely to take action in support of climate change or environmental protection. But then after we gave them that snippet, this is the green line. People who are more system justifying were actually more willing to sign those petitions and take action on climate change. So this is a you know, pretty strong interaction. And the reason I think this is happening is because it addresses people's perceived conflict between their needs. They think they need to do one or the other, economy or, or you know, address climate change. But in fact, we're showing them, no, no, the two go together. You can meet both at the same time. And that harnesses system justification needs rather than having to work against them. And I think this is the crux. We have to learn how to work with people's needs because those motives are so strong, we don't really have a chance of getting anything done if we're trying to work against them. And the other takeaway is we wanna make climate communication relevant to people's needs, both personal needs, as well as those related to the systems that we inhabit. And, and that leads us to a focus on solutions. So I'll address each one of these in turn. So here's some examples. Um, this is, Obama was really good at talking in this way. I think he really had an intuition for this. So this is a quote from him. He said, this investment will not only, this was about a clean energy investment, not only help us reduce our dependence on foreign oil, make the United States more secure. So this is pro-system and it will, but it'll give us a clean energy future. So this is pro-climate, saving our planet, transform our industry, steer our country out of economic crisis, pro-system and give us green jobs, right? So you could see how he's tying these together. They're not in conflict, they go together. This is Pope Francis who has uh, really emphasized the conjunction between being you know, a good Christian or a good person with stewardship and support for um, ecological health. Uh, and it's interesting because actually among conservatives, Catholic conservatives tend to be the most pro-climate oriented in terms of religious groups. Um, this is a project uh, called the Green Patriot Posters. Um, they also did that picture of Obama, if you remember, with those same colors as this one that was very popular. Anyway, uh, they link patriotism and clean energy. So here's a clean energy for America poster that really kind of, you know, wants to activate the, that, that sense of pride and connect that to clean energy, national pride. Um, this is a poster that, that shows that dependence on foreign oil is a problem for the country. So again, trying to link the two. Um, and then coming back to norms that I started talking about before, I think is a very powerful tool. And just to say a little bit about that, there's so much written about norms and, and you know, if this resonates for you, there's a great deal of research to draw from. This is just a tiny little drop. Um, so this is just one of my favorite studies. So even though it's old already, but I'll share it with you. Um, so there's two kinds of norms. There's the norms that uh, we, they're descriptive and prescriptive. So descriptive norms tell us about what a group actually does. And then we try to align to that. And prescriptive tells us what the group tells us we should do. So we align to both of those. We try to act in line with them so we can be accepted in those groups. So this is a study that was done in hotels. Uh, you've probably noticed they put little signs encouraging people to reuse their towels. This was done a while ago. So they looked at this standard message that said, help save the environment. And they thought, this isn't taking advantage of our psychological process. Let's see how we can use norms to make it better. So they said, they set the norm. They said, join your fellow guests in helping to save the environment. So they made it not just about the environment, they made it about the social environment that we're in. You're a guest these other guests who are in your same shoes. This is what they did. 75% of guests were asked to participate in our research savings program and they did so. And you can join them. So they're no longer saying, do you wanna save the planet? They're saying, do you want to be like the other people who stay in this hotel? And then they had a third condition in which they said, not only fellow guests, but those who stayed in your room, 75% of them reused their towels. 
So as you can guess, what they found is that the standard message got about a third of the people to reuse their towels. Once you put the norm in there, that went up to 44%. But once it was what they call provincial norm in your own room, that went up to almost 50%. That's a really big statistical difference. Um, and so that teaches you two things. Norms are very effective and you really want to focus on the local because we care about our locality. This is who we align to. These are like deeply seated psychological processes and the idea is to take advantage of them. What was interesting, oh, here's another example, um, uh, which is a, a more recent one. So there's a company called Opower and they started um, working with utilities to put inform norm information into people's utility bills and they would compare your and continue to compare your energy usage to your neighbors and let you know how you're doing and then they would put uh, they let you know what the normal rate is so setting the norm and telling you how you compare to that and then they also um, so they saw pretty big changes and then they also thought about people who actually already perform well and they didn't want them to adjust down to the norm. So they put uh, smiley faces. To, so again, like a social encouragement saying, we like you, you're doing great um, in order to help them maintain their, their efficient rates. And so what's interesting about this study is they managed to maintain an almost like a two to three and a half percent constant reduction in energy use. It's very hard to maintain those reductions over time. So they're very effective. Um, Distributed solar adoption. What do you think is the strongest predictor of rooftop solar installation? It's whether your neighbors do it. I mean, it has to be for people who have homes where they can install solar and they have to have the resources to do that. So that's of course really important, but to the extent that they have those resources, it's whether or not people in your, I think three block radius install it and then people do it. Victory gardens, another really interesting example during World War II, there was a need to grow food people locally in their homes. And uh, at the time in the US, it was considered a kind of a low class activity to grow your own food. It was a time of transformation towards consumerism and industrialization. So they had this campaign called Victory Gardens where they legitimized that a norm that it was okay to grow food in your own yard. And they had people put the, their gardens in the front yard. They had posters, they had famous people say that they're growing food, that it's a desirable thing. So they reset the norm around growing your own food and ended up creating a big, a big movement that met the food needs of the country. So what was interesting about that study, the hotel studies, even though they had such really striking results, a lot of hotels didn't switch because hotels have their own social norms. And so they needed explicit organizational support in order to make that shift um, and to change the institutional practice. So these apply at all levels of the individual, institutional and systemic. Um, so, so I want to share a study that I did with you. I try to find examples of things in the real world. That's where I'm drawn to, you know, even if we do experimental studies with people not in the lab, it's still not the same as things happening in the world. So this is a study that I was lucky to get to do um, as I worked at a wonderful company called Climate Central for a while where they have a program called Climate Matters and they provide broadcast ready climate information for local TV weathercasters. And the purpose of this program is to get local messengers that people trust and have a relationship to, to talk about climate change in the context of their communication, in this case about weather. And um, let me give you, let me show you what this looks. Oh, where's my, oops. Yeah, there, sorry, put it in the wrong place. These are some of the, um, uh, Im images that they provide. So they're typically like bright and engaging and easy to understand. And it shows, like in this case, it shows trends and how temperatures changing. Here it's showing flooding due to climate change. And then it talks about things that are relevant to health. For example, how CO2 relates to pollen production and, and allergies. Here's one about uh, winter activities and, and uh, recreation. So, uh, sorry. Um, so yeah, so they provide this information to weather casters and sometimes you're able to put it on air, but very often they put it on Twitter. And so what I wanted to see is how and when do people respond to messages about climate change? And these weather casters are reaching all kinds of people all across the country. And then does the, I wanted to know, does the relevance to people's needs, because this is my core question, make these climate messages more appealing? So we surveyed all 
the Twitter um, feeds of all local meteorologists at the time from all major TV networks, whether or not they were um, in our program. We collected 8.5 million tweets over a period of two years. And we looked at the number of retweets of messages. And so, sorry, so we cleaned out all messages that had to do with football and food and whatever, and just focused on the ones that had to do with weather and climate change. And um, what we found surprisingly is that climate change tweets received greater engagement that what, than weather only tweets. We didn't know what to expect. And what was, so this was really encouraging because people were interested in the topic. And the more frequently the weathercasters talked about climate change, the more their messages were retweeted. So it sound, it felt like they were sort of creating a, a conversation or building trust or building engagement somehow by repeatedly messaging about climate change. So that was very encouraging because we thought, well, maybe people are just dismissing these or saying disparaging things about them. So then what we did is we looked at, well, when are these messages retweeted more? So we overlaid the um, occurrence of severe weather over these messages. And that what we found is when severe weather is occurring, there's not a lot of interest in climate change messages, which makes sense. People are focused on the impacts, what's happening in the moment. But then over time, the discussion of severe weather when it's not happening in conjunction with climate change leads to much greater engagement. So people are paying attention. People obviously notice weather. And when it's being linked to climate change, they're taking an interest in that connection. And then we looked at five domains of relevance that so inside those messages was climate change linked to other topics that people may care about. And those were perceived risk, possible or damage that has been caused economic implications, health, and system political legal implications. And what we found was that messages about climate change got more responses if they were linked to the things people care about, damage, economics, health, socio-political system. So that link between climate change and the things that are relevant in people's lives is what made those messages particularly uh, uh, engaging. We also saw that, um, interestingly, we had greater response among our rural uh, respondents and, and well, they're not our respondents out there in the Twitter world. And Republican respondents, we don't know individually what they were, we just looked by area, but that was really interesting. And that's something that I think deserves further study. So the, the messages, the learnings are, Localized messaging is really important. People have pride in place. Um, you want to frame around local impacts and, um, and it's more tangible for people and more relevant. And we know that people also look at their local weather to reach conclusions about climate change. So locality really matters. Um, and then this question of messengers, how do you find trusted messengers and the importance of using trusting messengers to deliver this information. There's some interesting research showing that you know, even though there is skepticism, actually even conservative audiences trust um, science agencies more than we might expect, Trump voters, and then of course, um, you know, their religious and political leaders and such, but that's an important question of how to engage trusted messengers. And that leads us to, um, I know we don't have a lot of time and there's so much more I wanted to tell you, but I just wanna play this quick clip of Catherine Hayhoe, who is a, a climate scientist and also a um, Christian person. Can you hear the sound? Um, don't, uh, not yet. No, oh gosh, I don't know you, how to share the sound. Oh, you have to go to the upper part of your screen where you share and then yeah. there's options and then you're, you can uh, click on share the sound or on share. And when you share, there's going to be an option on the bottom of the. You know, link. I'll skip this and I'll put the link to it in the chat and you guys watch it. It's really good. Okay. Because there's a, a bunch more that I want to talk about. You have like about five minutes if we, if you want to yeah. have 10 minutes for questions. You're good. Yes, I know time is short. So, well, so what she basically says is, and she's, she's a fundamentalist Christian and she's a climate scientist and she's brilliant and amazing. She says, don't start talking with climate change. Start with what you share with the person you're talking to and what they care about, and then move into um, talking about the science. And so, yeah, so, um, 
this this connects to uh, a lot of research on conversations and how to have those conversations. So you want to start with what people care about and what you share with them, um, and uh, and that creates a very different frame and it acknowledges people for who they are, and then uh, and then it gives them a sense of what you're talking about is for them rather than against them, just like that reframing of climate communication. Um, oops. So here, I'll skip this, but um, but the same actually goes for conversations with families. There's a really, there's a lot of research showing that there's people who won't listen to anybody else, but they will listen to family. And so again, you're starting from not just a shared ground, but from a place of love and appreciation and listening. I think this is a really interesting thing that we never think about in research, but actually listening more than you talk can sometimes build the common ground so that the other side then listens. Um, I'm going to skip this because I want to talk about solutions since you guys brought it up. So solutions are really key for multiple reasons. One is that when we talk about problems, they elicit a lot of fear. And there's research uh, around fear appeals. This is something that was done in public health with like smoking, quitting. Um, and what uh, the, the assumption was, if we scare people, they'll do something to you know, alleviate that fear. But actually they found the opposite, that fear inhibits constructive action because in order to manage that fear, people disengage from the information and they blame the messenger. And so, and then they lose a sense of efficacy and empowerment. And we could see that with climate change, like in the US, only 4% of Americans think that we can and will successfully reduce climate change. 42% think that we could do it, but they don't know if we will. Only a quarter believe or no quarter believe that we won't tackle it because people are unwilling to change. There's a lot of you know, doubt. And so solutions are needed, a focus on solutions to build efficacy and build empowerment. But the problem is for a lot of people, there's a version to solutions because they think it involves regulation, government involvement, all of that. And so the idea is to help people see that that the solutions actually are, are the key. So we need a narrative that aligns, solution narrative that aligns with values, outlines the benefits of action and connects clean energy innovation to economic well-being, American prosperity. You're hearing the same message now. So that, that connection, so the two go together. And so you wanna alleviate threats, um, connect solutions to values, engage audiences to create a sense of impact in community, like we're doing this together. So I'm just gonna show you some really interesting polling data that was alluded to before. So if you look here, this is a question of, will you support climate friendly energy policies? So Republicans, 87, 81, 72% of Republicans support even like, um, so tax rebates, and research into renewables, tax rebates for solar panels and energy efficient vehicles. These are really high percentages. And even regulations of carbon dioxide. These are conservatives overall. You can see these numbers are totally different from support you know, belief in climate change, right? They're so much higher. Here's another one. These are Trump voters. Three out of four Trump voters support action to accelerate the development and use of clean energy, strongly support and somewhat support among Trump voters. Again, you know, really high numbers. Um, there's a lot of numbers here, but this is basically basically showing that across the different regions of the U.S. that have very different attitudes towards climate change, support for wind and solar is very high, pretty much consistently across the country. Even though attitudes towards climate change, they're all in the 70s and 80 percent support, um, 60 here, even though uh, there's a lot of climate denial. So for me, these are really fascinating. And if you look at this comparison, this is the, the graph I showed you in the beginning where there's really not a lot of change in people's beliefs. But then when you look at support for solutions, they're much higher among conservatives than they, than they are, than the beliefs are over here. So um, what I've done, I'm gonna take two more minutes, is I've looked at conservative organizations that work on climate change to see what, how are they messaging and what are they finding among their audiences whom I don't have access to. Clear Path is an interesting um, organization. What they find is that a lot of Republican voters support accelerating development and reuse of clean energy. So this is the GOP here um, and then GOP conservatives. So these are again, really strong numbers of support. 
And what they find is that a lot of uh, Republican voters think that clean energy keeps us healthier, safer, and more prosperous. So those co-benefits that you were mentioning, um, that they see broad support for clean energy um, in, and for rooftop solar, net metering, um, and that the best messaging on clean energy depoliticizes the climate and emphasizes the wide array of benefits that clean energy provides. So moving away from that whole polarization around climate change and just sticking to the solutions. Um, they see that they support cleaner, healthier, less pollution, innovation, um, less dependence on energy from the Middle East. Like these are all things that resonate with people. And, um, yeah, again, so freedom from independence, market-based um, and, uh, and caring for future generations as well. And so there's a lot of touch points. So their research gets even more detailed about what really works. Um, but the bottom line is don't lead with climate because it's become so polarized tap conservative values or any other values, depending on what population you're working with, just start with their values and then promote practical solutions that empower people and give them a sense of efficacy. Um, and in this case, be bold about bipartisanship. So the sense that we have a shared reality among us. And then, you know, other, other findings from research with these more climate sort of resistant audiences, address uncertainty, make it relevant, overcome fatalism, build a solution story. So you're seeing the pattern of findings here. So conclusions, responses to climate messages are driven by underlying needs and motives. Climate communication is going to be more effective if you speak to people's needs to protect themselves, their families and society at large and to prioritize upholding what people identify with, focus on solutions, don't overwhelm people with negative information, just really help them see what they can do and how there's a shared sort of community and reality around them doing it. And norms, don't forget about norms. That's really one of the greatest tools of, around getting people on board. All right, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Figina.